morning and welcome back to the channel. We left you in the last episode parked up in the car park outside Morpeth Football Club with just a few fellow travellers to keep us company. Now we did have to move Harry last night as a tarmac road maintenance van bizarrely parked right next to us and at the time we felt it was a little inconsiderate but we realised that he was just securing his equipment in the trailer by parking right to the back of the tree. So we moved to the other side of the car park and it was no big deal. So we've uh, just called into Morpeth Town Centre, just gone to Morrison's to fill up with LPG. <coughs> it's about, um, it's the second time we filled up on this trip. It's quite embarrassing when I go in because uh, I think it was £2.52 this time. <laughs> and Joan's just gone into uh, Morrison's now to just do a bit of, uh, just get a f uh, some water and some uh, bit, a few provisions and that. Uh, it was a good park up last night. Um, I didn't sleep very well. Uh, it took me ages to go to sleep. It was like one o'clock in the morning. I sort of went to sleep, then I woke back up again. Um, I think I was probably a bit more thinking about the security of the van for whatever reason, because we just purely put the, we didn't put the screens on last night with the car park that we were in, which we, I didn't know where to put my steering lock on or not um, in those situations, because obviously we're in the van anyway. Um, so Jane's still not feeling a bit under the weather. She won't be on camera much today. Uh, Steak and bacon. Oh, you got some corn, did you? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna try that tonight. It's got high water. So we just parked in Morpeth in the Stanley something car park. Um, and you have to display, you go up to a, a machine up there and you put a pound coin in and you get this um, disc that you can have forever and a day apparently. I was just talking to a local, she said every time you come to Morpeth you just display that, they're quite hot on check-in. You get three hours of parking, you just need to display this. But I find it quite weird because it's a pound for a lifetime. Uh, so I'll just that to 10.25. But it's on a trust basis so quite weird. Anyway. And while I rest in the van, Stu goes out and explores the town. This bridge has connections with Thomas Telford, although it's unclear if he designed it or he just supervised the work. This is the Chantry footbridge and it was built in 1869 and it sits on the older 13th century bridge and it went under a recent refurbishment in 2004. Stu enters the Carlisle Park which is really well maintained and it comes with a lot of history on site. Haw Hill in the centre of the park was the site of a Mott and Bailey style castle. It was built in 1095 and was originally a wooden structure and like all castles it was replaced by stone but unfortunately by the 13th century it was burnt down by King John but it was eventually rebuilt on the adjacent hill. This statue is of Emily Wilding Davison she was a suffragette who spent her life fighting for the votes for women. And unfortunately, at the age of 40, she was killed by throwing herself in front of the King's Horse at Epsom. The building you see here is the Morpeth Courthouse, built in 1822. And originally, it was a lot bigger as it contained the county jail. come down so that's ended with photography trip. Morpeth is a busy little town but unfortunately today the weather's against Stu so he heads back to Harry taking what pictures he can in the rain. With Jane feeling a little low we decide a nice drive inland is in order to find a park up for the day. So we head towards a large National Trust location at Cragside, which is a short 15 mile drive away.
finally arrive and hand over our National Trust cards to get us free access. Hi there. Good morning. Welcome to Craig's site. Thank you. While I stay in Harry, Stu goes out and does the tour of the really impressive grounds and house. This is right up Stu Street as the family have links to engineering innovation as you'll see. And he makes his way around the house which is really busy today. Craigside is a 19th century mock Tudor mansion set in the landscape of a rock garden. It was built in 1863 for industrialist and inventor William Armstrong. He was an engineer, a scientist and a philanthropist. In 1880, Baron Armstrong called upon architect Richard Norman Shaw to transform his house into a state-of-the-art mansion an elaborate country house in Tudor style, incorporating a science laboratory and an observatory. But he was more than an inventor, he was also a landscape gardener and he laid out five lakes on the Cragside estate and planted thousands of trees and shrubs. And it was indeed a house of innovation and invention. Cragside was a house full of features that we all take for granted today, but at the time they were the leading edge of technology and innovation in the late Victoria period. Lord Armstrong introduced gadgets and features using hydraulics and water power to drive pressure to household appliances and lighting to the house. Craigside was the first building in the world to be lit by hydroelectric power and in 1868 a hydraulic engine was installed using water to power electrical appliances like a lift, a rotisserie and a clothes washer. And in 1870, the water from one of the lakes on the estate was used to power a dynamo, creating one of the earliest hydroelectric power stations in the world. In 1878, an arc lamp was installed in the gallery, powered by the dynamo. And just two years later, in 1880, the arc lamp was replaced by incandescent lamps, creating the first house in the world to be lit by electricity generated from water power. At the top of the house they recreated some of the experiments that were carried out. Using holograms, a clever interactive set of displays have been created that are historical and educational. With a thread of lamp cotton between the two glasses. Firstly, I'm going to fill the glasses with chemically pure water. As you can see, there's an electrode in each glass, one positive and one negative. For this experiment to work properly, we need between 5,000 and 15,000 volts. So, now watch very carefully as I discharge the electricity through the electrodes. As you can see, a wonderful electrical discharge pattern has developed. Stu finally exits the building and he heads down through the impressive rockery towards the front lake. So that was a uh, really fascinating tour around the house. It's a shame Jane couldn't go, go around. I said, I think we went to this house probably about four, five, six years ago before we got Harry, when we did a tour which actually got us into uh, 
traveling we uh, came in our mini and just stopped from place to place and this was just one of those places we went to so there's loads of walks apparently there's about 40 miles of walks you could go on around here so if you've got a national trust card this needs to be high on your list it's expensive to get in if you're not it was 21 pounds for an adult each that would have been 42 pounds for us well it's 120 pounds for a full year's membership so i think if you're watching this video and maybe you're coming in from europe definitely if you're in this, this area you should come here but you might want to consider buying a year's membership because like i said this is a third of the membership fee apparently in one of the uh, storms recently um i think i think i want to say arwin probably got that wrong um but there was over a thousand trees that blew down and i've got a big project going on at the moment to clear those re replant etc so it was uh, devastated a bit by that you can see that uh, around me on this side of the um the park the pump house was the power source where the hydraulic ram pumped water up to a reservoir high above Cragside House, which provided its domestic water supply and powered the main lift and turbines operating kitchen and laundry equipment. And as recently as 2014, a modern version of an ancient Archimedes screw has been installed. It captures the power of a stream that's in the grounds and it provides lighting for the house. There's a good quality cafe and toilet facilities by the lakeside. And then you can do, which is what we did, is take a drive around the estate on the old carriage road and it takes you right through the centre of the building. plenty of car parks along the way to stop and have a picnic, although some unfortunately were closed due to the recent storms where hundreds of trees were blown down in Storm Arwen. And if you are a National Trust member it's definitely worth a visit. So we decide to drive further north, to Annick, where we do stop for the evening. So this is in the outskirts of Alnick, Alnwick rather. So it's on par for night, there's no signs um, at all, so I guess we're okay. It's not the prettiest views, but it'll do for sleeping tonight. Stu has a very quick look around on his own, and it's definitely a place that deserves more time spent at it. It's got an impressive castle and gardens at its heart, as well as a variety of historical sites, but unfortunately for us, it's gonna have to be another time. So tonight's tea, it's sort of a vegetarian version of what we did last night. But what we've done here, um, in the bottom there, there's you know, peppers, but there's corn this time. Um, onions, courgettes, and tomato, I think. Isn't it? 
no, uh, peppers. And then we put quinoa uh, to warm through for about three minutes. It looks a bit dry. We also put some uh, passata sauce in. So I think it might need a bit more of that, but we'll see. We'll let you know. That looks all right to me. That's, that's, okay. oh, I thought you were giving me that. Looks fairly dry to me. Token for you, celery sticks. <laughs> right, tuck in. So it's actually moist than I thought that is. I think what I'd have done is probably cook the onion and the pepper and the courgette first before putting the corn in, whereas you normally do the chicken first before you do that. And because I don't think the corn takes much to do, and the quinoa is quite nice. And the tomato sauce, passata sauce, just puts a bit of moisture to it. So I think it's alright. It? It's a packet quinoa, isn't it? It's a packet quinoa, yeah. Mm. That's right. Stu settles down and enjoys the sun. But we then witness this unbelievable sight of a young lad with a McDonald's who simply opens his car door and leaves the rubbish on the ground. So unfortunately the car's driven off, so there's a young lad in a bit of a boy racer type car, which, which is fine, I haven't got a problem with that. He's come and he's just dumped his stuff there. I just does my bloody head in. It's his McDonald's. I'll go and pick it up and put it in a bin. I just don't understand people's mentality when they do that. We were so tempted to say something, but we don't because we don't want to cause issues for ourselves in the night. So Stu went and picked it up and put it in the bin, which was a hundred yards away, and nothing that the Joker couldn't have done himself. Well, we'll leave it there, and I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if so, please give us a like. And if you're not already subscribed, please think about doing so as it really supports the channel. And we'll see you in the next episode.